All right, this is Microbiology Lecture 13. <clears throat> We're going to continue uh, discussing antimicrobial drugs. In uh, Lecture 12, we talked about antibacterial drugs. And in this lecture, we'll talk about antifungal, antiviral, uh, and antihelminthic uh, drugs. We might talk about antiprotozoan. I can't remember right now. Um, <clears throat> So there's many drugs uh, that are effective to greater or lesser extent against these kind of uh, major groups of organisms. The, um, there are uh, a number of them that have, are used commonly and I'll discuss those uh, in the next few slides and I'll discuss more the mechanisms of action and and uh, idea behind their use. <clears throat> to begin with, we'll talk about antifungal drugs. Antifungal drugs, I've already discussed this with you previously, is um, it's it's a more uh, difficult topic uh, for development of successful antifungal drugs. You have to be able to uh, develop something that's uh, not going to harm the eukaryotic cells of the host. So our own cells are eukaryotic and fungi are eukaryotic. So <clears throat> it's a little more, it's a lot more difficult to design an antifungal drug than it is to come up with an antibacterial drug. Um, <clears throat> cellular mechanisms and cell structures are much more similar to human cells and therefore uh, developing something that is selectively that's selectively toxic just for the fungal cell but not for the human cells is more difficult there are several mechanisms um, that are targeted by uh, antifungal drugs that are available now one is, and I've mentioned this before, is uh, inhibition of fungal sterol uh, synthesis. So, <clears throat> uh, unlike you carry, unlike human cells, which have cholesterol in the cell membrane, um, fungal cells have sterols, and so some antifungal drugs will target uh, sterol uh, synthesis and uh, insertion into the cell membrane. There are also mechanisms that <clears throat> inhibit cell wall synthesis. Uh, nucleic acids, uh, there are some differences between human and fungal nucleic acids, which I won't get into the details of, but so some drugs can inhibit those uh, with more specificity. And uh, inhibition of uh, microtubules that are involved in the mitotic process in fungal cells. So we'll go through some of these. The antifungal drugs inhibiting fungal sterols include um, uh, myconazole. These target uh, uh, sterols in, in, this, in the plasma membrane. As I said, the uh, the sterol in humans is cholesterol, and the sterol in the plasma membrane of fungal cells is actually different. It's called ergosterol, a specific sterol in the fungal plasma membrane. Um, the drugs that act against the cell membrane in fungal cells will make them more permeable uh, so that they lose their semi-permeable nature and get disrupted and it disrupts the cell. The uh, characteristic one that is used uh, in, um, <clears throat> in fungal infections, particularly fungal infections that are systemic fungal infections, um, it, the drug used is amphotericin B. Now, these drugs actually are not without some toxicity to the human cells but there are very few uh, effective drugs uh, that can uh, kill fung uh, systemic fungal infections. And uh, some of the ones that are a real problem include uh, histoplasmosis, 
uh, a fungal infection disease, a fungal in infect infection disease called histoplasmosis, and another one called co coccidioidomycosis, um, which I have actually mentioned previously. As I said, there are also uh, some some of these antifungal drugs will uh, target not the cell membrane but the cell wall. Um, they'll inhibit synthesis of part of the cell wall, and um, these can be used uh, for certain infections uh, that um, are found typically in immunocompromised patients. Um, all of these. All of these organisms here, these are the gene, uh, genera names for these organisms, the genus name for each of these different or, uh, uh, genera, Aspergillus, Candida, and Pneumocystis. Candida, all of them are uh, found normally present growing on um, individuals, normal individuals as part of the uh, normal microflora or are found throughout the environment and, and all around us and are never a problem, never cause infections. Uh, these two are an example of that, candida and pneumocystis. But in uh, individuals who are immunocompromised, they get uh, uh, chronic uh, candida or pneumocystis infections, which can be treated by drugs that uh, target the cell wall. As I said, there are also drugs that inhibit nucleic acids in uh, fun fungi. I'm not going to get into it other than to explain that um, most uh, most of the drugs that actually act on uh, nucleic acids and nucleic acid synthesis, uh, what they do is they are uh, similar to normal nucleotides. And in other words, they are uh, analogs. So this one, uh, and I wouldn't worry about the name, but it's a cystazine analog. So it interferes with uh, RNA synthesis in the, in the fungal cells. What uh, happens with these analogs is that uh, if you have a double-stranded uh, section uh, of DNA they'll, or RNA, that, uh, or a single strand section of RNA, they'll insert at a certain point. And once that insertion occurs, the strand can't elongate or the, or it can never be copied from that point onwards. There are also drugs that inhibit microtubules and microtubules are quite important in uh, the process of mitosis. Uh, a very commonly used antifungal drug is called griseofulvin. It's uh, particularly effective against superficial mycoses. Remember, you have to understand and know what a systemic or superficial or um, uh, any of the different categories of uh, mycoses that I taught you. Um, the superficial mycoses uh, um, infect structures that are at the surface that are not part of the living tissue. So uh, it'll be things like hair or skin or nails, which is not live tissue. These kind of infections uh, are called, uh, in general, tinea infections. And the drug uh, griseofulvin is effective because it uh, binds to keratin that's found in these. Keratin is a normal fibrous protein found in hair, skin, and nails. And it uh, is, the drug will bind to the keratin. These organisms, these uh, superficial uh, fungal infections, superficial mycoses, um, are sensitive to the effect of, uh, they eat keratin, they feed off keratin, and they're sensitive to the uh, drug griseofulvin, which binds to that keratin if you're taking the drug. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier uh, uh, inhibition of nucleic acids. I don't know why there's this, it's, it should be moved one higher. Um, 
This is another drug. It's used for uh, pneumocystis pneumonia, pneumonia caused by a uh, species member of this genus, pneumocystis, pneumocystis gyro, called pneumocystis gyrovecchi or gyrovecchi. Uh, as I told you earlier, pneumocystis is a uh, fungal organism that's found all around us. It's everywhere in our environment. Here they're calling it Pneumocystis carinii, but that's the older name. The uh, name has been changed to Pneumocystis gyrovecchii. It's an important organism because it's seen typically in individuals, infects individuals who's, uh, who are immunosuppressed, uh, individuals whose immune systems have been suppressed either uh, by some sort of treatment uh, or by infection uh, uh, with HIV so that they have acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. You know, individuals who have been treated uh, uh, with chemotherapeutic drugs that uh, target cancer cells also get uh, a suppression of their, of their bone marrow. And so their immune systems become suppressed. Uh, typically, <clears throat> pneumocystosis, um, that's the infection or disease caused by pneumocystis uh, gyrovecchi. Uh, pneumocystosis is uh, uh, typically seen right towards uh, the end of uh, life uh, in uh, AIDS patients when they're dying. Now, many AIDS patients now uh, uh, in, individuals infected with HIV, they can't be cured, but they can certainly their uh, progress of their disease and their symptoms can be uh, significantly uh, uh, suppressed with uh, drugs that they're receiving now that have been developed over the past uh, uh, 20 years, roughly. So pneumocystis gyrovecchi is a uh, opportunistic uh, organism that infects uh, immunosuppressed individuals. Um, and it can be inhibited with uh, inhibitors of nucleic acids. Okay, we finished with um, antifungal drugs and now we'll talk about antiviral drugs. There is an error on this slide. You can take this out. This is a, a slide just to introduce the concept of antiviral drugs. As you recall, uh, viruses have uh, several different uh, key steps in their process of infecting and uh, replicating inside a host cell. And uh, what antiviral drugs do is that they target these uh, processes or mechanisms, including attachment, penetration, uncoating, nucleic acid synthesis, and assembly. Uh, these are most, not all, but most of the main steps in um, in uh, viral uh, 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 viral infection infective cycle, um, <clears throat> and uh, we'll look at uh, different drugs that uh, target uh, different ones of these pro diff uh, different individual processes here. So, in terms of uh, <clears throat> targeting nucleic acid. Uh, uh, synthesis, uh, viral nucleic acid synthesis. A lot of the antiviral drugs that are used are analogs of nucleosides or nucleotides. The only difference between a nucleoside and a nucleotide is that the nucleotide has three parts of phosphate, a carbohydrate, or in the case of DNA, deoxyribose, in the case of RNA, ribose, and uh, nitrogen containing base and the nucleoside is the same except it doesn't uh, it's the same minus the uh, phosphate group so the nucleoside analogs that uh, are effective include things like acyclovir uh, that's the only one i'm going to mention to you right now uh, there have been quite a number um, uh, produced uh, there is another one, you don't have to learn the name of it. Uh, the brand name is uh, AZT. It, uh, it is, uh, has been used as an antiretroviral um, 
drug uh, for HIV infections in AIDS patients. Um, antiretroviral drugs, of course, uh, inhibit um, uh, reverse transcriptase, which is uh, RNA dependent uh, 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 polymerase, it's RNA dependent polymerase. Uh, viruses, retroviruses use it to make, retroviruses like HIV use it to make uh, DNA from uh, an RNA uh, template, using the information in the RNA to make DNA. And uh, this drug uh, targets that, so it's an antiretroviral uh, uh, um, uh, agent. Here you see that uh, these kind of drugs I told you are, uh, new, uh, are analogs. They have a similar but not identical structure to the naturally occurring um, nitrogen bases to, uh, often. Here we see guanine, that's the G in you know the nitrogen containing bases in DNA are A, T, G, and C. And guanine is one of them, and acyclovir is a uh, synthetic analog, a drug that acts as an analog for G. Here you see deoxyguanosine, the um, uh, nucleoside for uh, of G. There's the uh, there's the carbohydrate part, the uh, deoxyribose and there's the nitrogen containing base and you'll notice that uh, acyclovir has a change here in this so it acts as an analog it actually can insert but uh, prevents any further elongation this of course is a nucleoside I'm showing the natural nucleoside I'm showing here remember the nucleoside is the same as a nucleotide except it doesn't have the phosphate group. These analogs, as I mentioned to you in, the, in this one, it, it shows the idea here. You know, you have a, um, a nucleoside that's uh, getting phosphorylated here. Kinases are enzymes that add a phosphate group so the nucleoside becomes a nucleotide because it's phosphorylated, a phosphate group is added. And uh, the DNA polymerase uh, acts to incorporate that if uh, it's synthesizing a new strand and there it comes across a C in the template, it will insert a G on the newly synthesized strand. Here's a strand. There's the other the strand that's being copied. If there's a C in a position, then the G will be brought in, the guanine nucleotide, and get incorporated into the DNA. Uh, when a cyclovir is used, then you get uh, addition of the phosphate to a cyclovir, and uh, this false, essentially a, a false nucleotide, term is here, a false nucleotide, it's a nucleotide analog of G. Um, it will uh, block the action of the DNA polymerase, the enzyme that normally uh, brings in, assembles new uh, nucleotides, adds new nucleotides to the growing strand, okay? That's how these analogs often work. There are many uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors. I mentioned uh, one, uh, AZT, uh, also called retrovir. Uh, there are a lot of them. They're constantly being produced. Um, there are uh, nucleotide and nucleoside and uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors. There are a lot of different drugs that have been used for chemotherapy of HIV, and I'm sure that this is actually probably an out-of-date list of drugs, but you can be assured that there are many. None of them cure. They all 
inhibit the proliferation of the virus by preventing or slowing down viral replication in uh, infected cells. But uh, nobody's come up with an effective, an e effective way of eliminating the, the HIV virus from, uh, from an infected individual. So some of them, as I said, some antiviral drugs act as uh, enzyme inhibitors. They'll uh, inhibit proteases. And I don't need you to actually uh, read this. You can read it for your own information if you want. It's up to you. Uh, some drugs that are used are cytokines, naturally occurring cytokines. These are small protein molecules produced by immune cells normally, but these are also synthesized artificially in, in, uh, in manufacturing processes. Um, and the typical one that's used in uh, antiviral therapy is uh, interferon. Um, and has been used often for treatment if there isn't anything else that's, uh, that's effective. Okay, those were antiviral drugs. Now let's talk about antiprotozoal drugs. Uh, protozoa, as you know, are uh, eukaryotic single-celled organisms that are neither plant nor animal. Uh, they cause a number of uh, very, very serious diseases. They are extremely widespread in the world. Uh, protozoal infections are very, very common. Things like malaria, uh, uh, giard giardiasis, uh, uh, entamoeba, uh, uh, amoebic dysentery. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, different uh, protozoal infections, very widespread. Um, <clears throat> all of these uh, are involved in the treatment of malaria. Malaria is a really serious widespread uh, protozoal disease that is uh, uh, transferred by a, a mosquito vector from infected animals or people, uh, infected birds or people to uh, other birds or people. Uh, did I say birds? I don't believe that was correct. I'll take that one back. So malaria can be spread uh, from individual to individual by uh, mosquitoes that uh, carry the, they act as a vector, they carry the protozoa in their um, salivary glands and when they uh, insert their stinger into uh, into a person, when they bite a person, they insert this uh, tube-like structure and they inject a little bit of saliva because their saliva contains a anticoagulant and that way they can continue to drink the blood and it doesn't um, clot. And when they inject in that saliva, there's some malarial organisms in there that were growing in their salivary glands and that infects the individual. So they are able to transfer into individual, they're able to pick it up from one individual and transfer it to another one. And uh, it's a, quite a serious disease. The treatment involves the use of quine, quinine or synthetic analogs of quinine. Quinine is a naturally occurring uh, molecule that's found in the bark of a particular tree. I think it's a quinoa tree, uh, although I could be wrong about that, but it comes from a natural source. It is also, uh, there are also synthetic forms. Chloroquine is a synthetic form. Unfortunately, chloroquine resistant malaria has developed and is fairly wide, widespread. So now a uh, <clears throat> uh, further uh, second or third generation uh, form of uh, synthetic quinine called mefloquine is often used. There is another uh, drug which is um, quite an effective uh, drug against protozoal infections. It also has some antibacterial uh, activity for anaerobic organisms. It is called metronidazole. 
it uh, targets anaerobic uh, metabolic uh, uh, processes which are shared by uh, several protozoa and bacteria. It can be uh, used in the treatment of vaginitis, uh, inflammatory infection in the vagina caused by trichomon trichomonas. Uh, it can be used in, in giardiasis for infections by, which is a GI infection, gastrointestinal infection caused by giardia lamblia, and is also used in amoebic dysentery caused by entamoeba histolytica. It is important for you to realize that there are, in all of these diseases caused by microorganisms, be they bacteria, viral, protozoal, fungal, whatever, you need to understand the difference between the name of the organism, genus and species, and the disease, all right? And learn which organism causes which disease if I mention it. I'm not saying that specifically for these necessarily, but in general, <clears throat> you should be clear about it. One is the disease and the other one is the is the uh, organism that causes the disease okay all right <clears throat> let's move on to uh helminthic infections and drugs that are used in helminthic infections and as you can see i'm not going to get into any great detail i want to remind you that helminths are um, worms and that there are two major types of worms. There are the uh, flat worms, platy helminthes. Uh, uh, we've already learned that. Platy helminthes are the flat worms, and that includes uh, tapeworms. They're also part of the platy helminthes or platy helminths. So flatworms, platyhelminthes, and roundworms, or nematodes. Nematodes are the roundworms, platyhelminthes, platy from the word, you know, plate, the same derivation as the word plate, or um, uh, what am I, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, Anyhow, flat, uh, platyhelminthes and roundworms or nematodes. So there are different drugs that are effective against these uh, worm infections, helminthic infections. These are uh, parasitic infections, very, very, very widespread throughout the world. Many, many, many millions have these infections. Um, flatworms. I'm going to do it in yellow here. Flatworms and the roundworms or nematodes. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about um, how the appropriate therapy, chemotherapy, the appropriate uh, drug or chemical compound is used, chosen and used for dosage and uh, effectiveness and how they figure it out. Determination of an appropriate chemotherapeutic approach to infection. Um, you know, uh, somebody comes in and they have certain, they come in for treatment because they have symptoms and the symptoms often uh, need to immediate treatment because as you know microorganisms can grow quite fast and infections can progress quite quickly um, <clears throat> sometimes it's enough uh, often it's quite enough to that the the the, the signs and uh, uh, symptoms uh, are are characteristic enough that uh, a type of chemotherapy uh, can be chosen and prescribed and the person is sent off sent home uh, but uh, occasionally more than not that rare they it doesn't work and they come back because 
they have something that's not sensitive to what was prescribed, um, in which case determining the sensitivity of the infecting organism is key to successful treatment. Uh, so samples are taken, uh, you know, it could be a sputum sample or a sampling from the site of infection, uh, could be a, a blood uh, sample if, if they suspect that it's, uh, the person has septicemia. Uh, samples are taken and uh, sent to the lab to be grown and to be tested for drug sensitivity. What kind of drugs what kind of chemotherapeutic approach? Remember, chemotherapy is not restricted at all to treatment for cancer. It's any time that a chemical compound is used as a drug in a person. That's chemotherapy. So samples taken in the organism, they try to grow the organism in the lab and look for sensitivity. Is it um, sensitive or not? Um, So that's uh, what we'll discuss. And typically that involves uh, growing the organism on uh, nutrient agar plates or sometimes blood agar plates uh, and plating it at the same time putting on these uh, discs uh, that are impregnated with different uh, antibiotics to see if, as, and then they're cultured overnight to see if there's a zone of inhibition develop, whether a zone of inhibition develops or not, and uh, which drugs are effective. This is called the disc diffusion test. There's another name for it, but the most common one that I know is the disc diffusion test. This is another test where uh, the drug is infused in a, um, in a uh, long strip and there's a, uh, there's a gradient of concentration as you go uh, further down this way, it's a lower concentration. So at the center, it's placed along the rim one end is placed along the rim of the petri dish. This is the rim of the petri dish out here. And it's the strip is placed uh, pointing towards the center with the highest concentration on the outside. The organism is uh, plated. The entire surface is plated. And that's fairly easily done, plating the entire surface with the infecting bacteria organism. And then these strips are laid down and you see what the minimum inhibitory concentration is. So what this does is it not only shows a zone of inhibition, but it also shows the minimal inhibitory concentration so that it can be determined here. You see the minimal effective inhibitory concentration is shown here. That's where you have just the beginning, just the beginning of a zone of inhibition, just starting there. There's the zone of inhibition you see, there's no growth in, in there, in that area uh, there, in all of this area here, all through here, there's no growth, right? So that's the area of inhibition. <clears throat> the uh, minimal required, minimal inhibitory concentration is uh, shown here and here and on this one here. And typically they would pick a, higher concentration, at least twice the uh, uh, minimal inhibitory concentration as the, uh, to figure out what dosage to give. The, this kind of uh, minimal uh, inhibitory concentration determination allows for not only determining sensitivity, but also determining uh, effective concentrations that can this is another way of doing uh, finding out minimal inhibitory concentration, except using uh, liquid uh, cultures in small wells. I'm not going to get into this in any great detail. Now, as you know, many uh, microorganisms, I've already talked to you about this, many microorganisms, many bacteria particularly, have developed, although some protozoa also, 
and um, some viruses have developed uh, antibiotic resistant or resistance or chemotherapeutic resistance. The, uh, this is due typically to uh, mutational uh, events that have led to it and then uh, transfer from one organism to another. If we're talking about bacteria, often the gene, uh, mutated gene that allows for uh, res resistance to an antibiotic is on a plasmid. Uh, the mechanisms of antibiotic resistance include uh, ability to produce an enzyme that can destroy the drug and an example of that would be ability to produce beta-lactamase, which can destroy the beta-lactam ring in uh, different kinds of penicillins, or uh, pen uh, prevention of penetration of the drug, uh, alteration of the drug's target site. So the mutation causes a change in the part of the organism that usually the, the drug would target and the drug's no longer effective or a mutation that allows for pumping out of the drug so it gets pumped out, ejected so quickly out of the cell, organism cell that it's not effective in killing the organism. As I said, resistance genes are often found on plasmids and they can be transferred between bacteria by the process of uh, conjugation. Now, in this diagram, what they're showing is across the horizontal axis here, that's time and days. And across the vertical axis, it's bacteria. And it, of course, you know, when you talk about bacteria growth, the increase in numbers is growth. When you talk about bacterial growth, it's a logarithmic uh, increase. So the scale is log scale, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5. This is a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, a million. Okay. Along this scale, it's antibiotic resistance. And it's the concentration that uh, the organisms are, um, are resistant to. And what you see here is that the antibiotic resistance data is drawn in the red and the uh, bacterial count is in black. That's why here on this side it's in uh, the ink is black and that they use and on this side it's red, right? So what you see here on this graph is that uh, a person has an infection and the antibi and the uh, bacterial numbers are high and uh, antibiotic therapy is started, there is an exponential decrease from the soon after the start of the therapy there's an exponential decrease in the bacteria in the numbers if however the there are uh, antibiotic resistant organisms present in that population and they can be a very small number inside that fairly large number this 10 to the 8 is a uh, hundred million this is a experimental system in culture in a person it would be even much much higher numbers usually for bacterial infection but here you see the resistance uh, there there is no real resistance in these populations when they're you know sampled at different times if you take samples from the patient you don't see resistance but then when the organism starts to grow again you find that most of the organisms are in fact more and more and more organisms and quickly becomes you know all of the organisms are and the antibiotic resistant ones they're the ones that can grow the few survivors in this area here they were antibiotic resistant organisms and they quickly take over so it can switch very quickly so here you know everything's happy you know, up until day, say, four, things are getting better and better. And then after that, things rapidly become worse. Within a, a day, in this case, it's not in a patient, it's in vitro data, but it's it, it happens very quickly. And of course, you can't treat with that antibiotic anymore because they're virtually all resistant. Are there other 
uh, types of approaches to chemotherapy for uh, microorganism treatment, infections with microorganisms? Yes. Uh, people are working on them all the time. Two uh, approaches have been looking at uh, antimicrobial peptides. These are small proteins that uh, are produced by many organisms, including plants and animals. Uh, there have been some that have been described. The first ones uh, of these antimicrobial small peptides, small proteins, were described in the skin of frogs, and uh, found in the skin of frogs. They, frogs spend a lot of time in water that's not particularly fast flowing or fresh, and they defecate and pee into it and all sorts of other things grow in it. But they don't get many infections, and they have a very um, amphibians have a very thin skin. The reason they don't get infections are because of these peptides. We have antimicrobial peptides in our uh, that we produce in our uh, upper gastrointestinal tract, in the in the uh, mouth cavity, buccal cavity, the pharynx, and uh, they're quite effective at killing directly killing. Uh, organisms. There have been several uh, identified from different uh, present in different animals and people are trying to uh, you you know develop them so that they can be used as an antibiotic uh, therapy. There are also uh, attempts for many 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 years uh, to use bacteriophages as an antibacterial uh, agent. Remember, bacteriophages are viruses that uh, attack and uh, infect bacteria and will lyse the bacteria in their lytic cycle. Uh, it's been very intensely researched for many years. It's been demonstrated in a few cases to be effective. It's been used, they received permission to use it when uh, an individual is um, infected with uh, antibiotic uh, multiple antibiotic resistant uh, organism that there is nothing they can do for the person because there are no effective um, antibiotics. The organism growing in the person is uh, resistant to all of the available antibiotics and so sometimes they turn to things like this bacteriophage antibacterial therapy and have done so successfully. Uh, clearly effective in a very small number of cases, but it's not, uh, it hasn't been developed to the point where it can be used easily at a large scale. So not yet approved, uh, it's not yet an approved therapy at all. And that, I believe, is the end of uh, Microbiology Lecture 13.